this short documentary series on the humanities in Europe today, uh, which starts from Europe but will expand to cover, I hope, the whole world, is the initiative of the European network of humanities centres and institutes. We decided collectively with our colleagues that it would be a good idea to present a series of portraits of leading figures in the humanities in our part of the world and to use them as sources of inspiration, as role models, if you wish, for practitioners and students alike. The portraits of these very sort of charismatic, highly accomplished, distinguished professionals accomplishes another aim. It allows us to trace a genealogical sort of portrait of where the humanities have been, where they are at today and where they could go, insofar as each person that we interview is asked to trace their own itinerary, past, present and future. And simply by asking a question like, what was your faculty called when you studied as an undergraduate? And noticing the semantic, the institutional, the political transformations that the field has gone through. Just by doing that, I think the viewers should be in a position to measure the extent of the changes and the extent of the vitality of the field. The hope of this mini-series is indeed that we can collectively as practitioners, but also as spectators, express our love for, our trust in, our respect for this amazing field of the humanities at a time in its history when it is coming under attack in the press, in the public debate, um, in policy making and financial decisions that are really penalizing this field. The humanities in the 21st century as you will see in the different portraits of these great figures we're offering to you, are a vital, vibrant, critical, creative, extremely accountable field, proud of its history, confident of its place in the world, and very hopeful for the future. We really hope that you will enjoy uh, watching these great figures, and maybe you will be yourself tempted to run out and interview somebody that you know in your own neighborhood, in your own circles, because the humanities are everywhere and for everybody. I studied in Yugoslavia. I started studying in Yugoslavia on BA level. Uh, when I graduated on BA level as an undergraduate, it was already Republic of Macedonia, so Yugoslavia had fallen uh, apart. 88 uh, to uh, 92, I guess, uh, four years of that. Actually, five years. We had five years of study at my department. I studied classics. My department was called the Department of Classics. It was part of the Faculty of Philosophy. Uh, it's the oldest faculty uh, in uh, Macedonia and one of the oldest in former Yugoslavia. Uh, one, uh, some of the most prominent former Yugoslav and also Serb scholars in uh, classics in antiquity used to teach there like um, uh, Milos Djuric, Anica Savic, Rebac, I think that she is also famous in, um, in the field of feminism as well, uh, on European level, at least I hope so. She has contributed a lot. Right after enrolling uh, into this department and the Faculty of Philosophy, uh, right before that I thought of, uh, sort of imagined myself as a theater director so I was wondering about the choice but in the end it, it was a really quick choice I was actually supposed to go study uh, yeah theater directing in uh, Slovakia uh, back then and during that summer I realized that I was more theorizing about art than actually being capable of producing art so I decided that I would go for theory. So the, the first idea was theory. Uh, yes, in the area of humanities. Uh, then the, the immediate next thought was philosophy. Then it was uh, a retreat and then it was like, no, Greek philosophy. So that that's what prompted the, the choice. What happened at the Faculty of Philosophy 
uh, because this department is part of the Faculty of Philosophy, is that the, the, the department of Marxism was dismantled and uh, strangely it was turned into a department of humanities and after a year or so into a gender studies department. Uh, I have no uh, interpretation of this trajectory, how this came about, but this is the history of that department. So as part of the history of the faculty where I studied, I would define myself as a philosopher. Now, considering the fact that uh, the line of thinking I pursue is called non-philosophy, this sounds paradoxical, but... Um, Non-philosophy is just uh, one of the methods of dealing with philosophy, of doing philosophy. So, yeah, I have a very narrow definition of myself. I see myself as a philosopher, as a scholar in, in the humanities. I do have some uh, history of uh, activism, but I wouldn't say that what would be that's the, uh, a prominent feature in my career or anything that would define me, um, I would even say that it's a marginal thing compared to most of the time I've dedicated to uh, uh, what is actually scholarship, no, not really activism. Actually, I've always uh, tried to uh, transcend this uh, situatedness in a certain geography, in a certain political context, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, my interest in, in the Balkans, in uh, the, this, uh, the Balkan studies, as Svetlana Slavša uh, has termed, the, uh, term, uh, termed them, uh, has been also with the goal of sort of uh, trying to liberate uh, our scholarship from from this pressure to, to always situate ourselves in, within a certain uh, context, political context, actually to, to claim the right to think in universal terms about universal notions. I, I, uh, so, yeah, only in that sense, I think that I would, you know, um, define myself or, or, or consider relevant my relation to the Balkans. And uh, I think that it was an episodic thing when I uh, uh, dealt with these topics. And currently I'm politically active, but still my activism is linked to the status of the uh, university autonomy. So it's still uh, linked to my uh, métier, how do you call it, uh, craft. Uh, the context I'm coming from uh, is one where we really fight for the minimum autonomy of the university, the minimum, uh, minimum autonomy of the scientific thought and of education from state control. So uh, my uh, claim in this respect is very modest. I don't know if I can compare it to uh, the claims of similar for forms of activism in uh, Western Europe. Um, uh, the, the, the hold of the state over what education is supposed to be about and scholarship as well is so strong, at least in my context, uh, but um, I, I, uh, relying on some research I've done, I think that uh, it can be expanded to other uh, corners of Eastern Europe as well. Uh, is so strong that we really fight for just minimum democracy and minimum uh, autonomy there. Because the, the hold of the state is literal, literal, material. Uh, for example, uh, what they, uh, what the state tried to introduce last year, and why we started this massive riots. Uh, first, the students started started them, then the professors followed. Uh, uh, was um, the 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 attempt of the state of the Ministry of Education and Science to carry out uh, external? Uh, they called them external tests. Uh, so they're literally testing the students' knowledge and grading it and passing or not this, uh, this um, exam permits the student to continue 
his or her education in the university. So the, uh, the state acts in the stead of the university. So this is why I'm saying that the, the, the ambition is really very minimal. And what we're trying to protect is really very minimal. And what... Uh, uh, yeah. And what we have achieved so far is to, uh, to press the state to establish a moratorium on this law. And we're negotiating about a new law, the professors and the student plenum. So this is the state of affairs right now. My full-time position is at the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, it's, um, uh, it's an institute which is uh, primarily doing applied social sciences, which is uh, really not very close to my personal interests. But this is what we are registered and accredited for. So that means policy research, lots of policy research. I mean, this is a, a philosophy of Europe, uh, as far as I know. Uh, the European um, Union as a, a supernatural institution, let's call it, is pushing this in all, as far as I know, social sciences and humanities departments throughout Europe. This uh, pursuing of policy research, applied research. Um, so this is uh, a, a tendency. Um, this is what we're supposed to do primarily, but uh, what I, as a director of the Institute, try to do with this is to subvert it, to not just produce applied research that the state and the companies can use, but actually to uh, subvert it in such a way to produce um, um, the genuine critique of the society, of neoliberalism, of nationalism, uh, which is not uh, characteristic just of the Balkans, but of Europe as a whole, I think, and not just of Eastern, and of Western Europe as well. Uh, so uh, being creative uh, by way of doing very concrete research about very concrete issues and uh, being v rigorous about it and, try, uh, and starting for a, a, a radically critical position can bring about interesting results. So you don't have to be a puppet of a state if you do policy research. And this is uh, the philosophy of the Institute, uh, not just thanks to me, but thanks to the leading team there. Other researchers, junior res researchers have a similar philosophy. That is reflected also in the way we teach uh, I, I, I can really brag about the fact that our students are really, um, the, uh, I don't know, belong to the uh, cultural, let's say, an activist avant-garde in the country. So it's sort of reflected in the way we do education as well. Uh, precisely in the context of this entire debate on post-humanities and post-humanism, uh, uh, in, uh, in the context of this um, enhanced uh, technological development, uh, we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about enhancing the brain, etc., etc. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the technological progress uh, actually prompts serious political questions. For what good? For what purpose? Uh, enhanced brain for whom? for which sort of a political order. Uh, and this is why I think that, uh, you know, so you have to ask the question of the human subject, right? But the question of the human subject in the context of this debate uh, um, necessitates a political debate. And uh, actually it is, uh, it, it, is, it establishes immediately a political debate. This is why maybe I wouldn't divorce. Uh, social sciences from humanities and the other way around. Sure. Because the role of humanities is actually at this point politi a political one.